Hey Ross, I've been coming to ACC for, uh, it's since 2014, so coming up on uh, nine years now. So at work, I've been walking at lunch two to three days a week uh, with a colleague of mine for, I think it's been about four years now. During the COVID, kind of onset of COVID time, he wanted a religious exemption and he was getting some advice from me. So that really started the foundation of my everyday missionary story. So flash forward to about a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were out on one of our uh, routine walks where we often, you know, mix personal talk with some business talk. A personal subject came up and he was telling me about a family friend of his that uh, growing up went on some kind of trips, uh, short-term trips to help churches and things out. So, you know, we went on for a little ways and then during that walk, I really felt the Holy Spirit telling me, Andy, now is the time to talk, you know, about the Lord. And, you know, for many years I've wanted to do this and thought about it, but never really felt that prompting. In this case, I felt it, so I swallowed deep and went for it. And really what I, I then just opened a conversation up with, hey, tell me more about your family friend. And, you know, what was your experience growing up uh, in church? So then we, we continued walking for another 10 to 15 minutes, having that conversation about his background spiritually, what he grew up with. You know, he told me a little bit about why he's um, not really a regular church attender now. And then I got to talk to him about my faith and what it meant to me. So through that, it's really a journey of uh, several years of building relationship and building a friendship that's giving me the uh, opportunity now to take our relationship to a deeper level to talk about spiritual things. You know, spend time in prayer. Spend time in prayer before, during, and after your encounters with those folks. And when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you should definitely follow up and take care of that. Thank you so much for that. I want to welcome you if you're here in the room, as well as those that are joining us online or over at our West Side campus. Glad you're with us today. And I want to start this morning with a couple of questions. I often do that. And so my first question would be, uh, how many of you have ever had to do something that you really didn't feel comfortable doing or that you really didn't want to do? How many of you have did that? I bet every hand would probably go up in the room. I just got to share at least one of those moments for me would, would be when, when I had to ask Diane's dad for permission to marry her. And uh, I had recently popped the question. Fortunately, she said yes, uh, which meant that the only detail that was left was her father's blessing. And so we made a weekend trip up to her parents' dairy farm in Wisconsin, and I was incredibly anxious the whole time that I was there. After all, you got to remember, I'm like this wet behind the ears, 20 year old kid, and her dad, Dwayne, was a seasoned Norwegian dairy farmer. Uh, he was a man of few words, and he really possessed this kind of commanding sort of presence. And the whole time that I was there, I kept looking for the right moment to bring it up, and that perfect moment just never materialized. Well, having procrastinated the entire weekend, right before it was time to leave, I, I had to muster the courage and I, I ended up uh, having to locate him right before we were just about ready to get in the car. And where I found him was actually out in the milk barn cleaning out the stalls, which is just a nicer way of saying he was shoveling manure. That's what he was doing. Now, fortunately, I mumbled and I fumbled my way through the request and instead of unloading a shovel of manure on me, uh, he paused from his scooping and leaned on his shovel and he said something like, I think that would be all right. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. Not nearly as difficult as I made it out to be. Now, of course, you know, after that, we did have to settle on the bride price, which was two milk cows and a pig and 10 chickens. <laughs> but I didn't care because Diane was worth every bit of that. Well, my second question this morning would be this. How many of you would say that you feel at least, at least a little uncomfortable talking to other people about your faith in Christ? How many would say that? And I, I would be one of the first to raise my hand. 
Well, I will let you know that over the next two weeks, uh, I'm going to try to encourage as many in our church community as possible uh, to be willing to invest 30 days intended to really help us to become more confident at going public with our faith. And you got to know the reason why we're, we're taking the time and making the effort to do this is pretty simple. And the answer is, it's because Jesus is on a mission. And you might be thinking, well, Jesus on a mission, well, that's all well and good, but what does that have to do with me? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is that his mission is all about you, uh, along with every other human being on this planet. And so what, what is his mission? Well, he made it pretty clear one day after he hung out with this little short guy named Zacchaeus, who he'd invited himself over to dinner, and Zacchaeus decided to become a Christ follower, to put his trust in Christ. And in, in Luke 19, verse 10, uh, Jesus kind of followed that up and just made this incredible statement. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, you know, that category, lost, is actually the baseline of every person on this earth. Because we've all sinned, the Bible says, and because the wages of our sin is death, which in a spiritual sense literally equates to eternal separation from God. And so Jesus' mission is to rescue as many people as he can from that fate, and he can do that for anyone who will come to him in faith. And that's why I just want to say to you today, if you, if you haven't done that you really need to. And I would just want to implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Now, a lot of you could say, well, that's perfect because I've, I've actually helped Jesus on his mission because I'm now a Christ follower. And if that's true for you, then, then you've taken care of the most important detail of life. But that simply leads us to another very important detail of life. And that is that Jesus is on a mission and he wants you and you and you, he wants you to join him. Now to help us understand the biblical context for this, it's important to know that the early Christ followers had kind of assumed that Jesus had come to set up an earthly kingdom on this earth and rule over it while remaining on the earth. But then if you remember, something bad happened, right? He died. <laughs> and even though he explained to them over and over again that it was his plan that he would be executed, crucified, and then he would raise, be raised from the dead, I, I mean, they, they, even though he explained that, they were totally disheartened and demoralized for those three days that Jesus was in the tomb because it looked like it was, it was all over at that point. And the disciples, if you think about it, they had obviously felt very empowered when Jesus was with them. I mean, after all, they, they'd literally seen him calm a storm and feed multitudes of people with some little kid's meager lunch, and he had healed the sick and raised the dead, and he'd often silenced his worst critics. So you can imagine then how excited they must have been after the resurrection because now their hopes of an earthly kingdom ruled by him in person could once again become a reality. Until Jesus, after he'd rallied the troops, were told he, he took them away on a retreat. And I'm thinking the disciples had to be thinking to themselves, man, he's taken us somewhere for a strategic kingdom planning session. <laughs> but then he... Instead, he, he literally, if you remember, he left them standing on a hillside, dumbfoundedly gazing up at the sky as they watched him ascend into the clouds, and then he disappeared before their eyes. <laughs> and just like that, he was gone. And you can read about the whole story in Acts chapter 1. In fact, I'd encourage you to do that if you get a, a chance to read Acts chapter 1. And because of what he told them, the disciples had to be thinking to themselves, man, it would be so much easier to introduce people to Jesus if he was actually here. <laughs> but now he's not. And to top it off, he's left us in charge. 
Now, you know Jesus is still planning to be with them, but it was in a different way than they had ever imagined. And, and we know this because the final directions that Jesus gave to his followers before he physically left this earth included clear instructions about what they were to do in his absence, as well as the assurance of his abiding presence, which leads us this morning to the final chapter of the book of Matthew, the last three verses. If you have your Bibles, you wanna follow along, it'll also be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And this was right before he left. <laughs> and then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all of it, in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Therefore, you're now responsible to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and surely I will gonna be with you always to the very end of the age. Now, when Jesus said that, please note, it looks like the expiration date for the Great Commission appears to be at the end of the age, meaning Jesus' second coming. We're still on task and tell them. And that means that since these were his, since these were his final instructions to his followers, uh, they need to be carried out until he returns again uh, to give us our next assignment. And, and what I'm hoping is clear is that since Jesus is on a mission, if you have chosen or, or have become his follower, you means you automatically join Jesus on his mission. Because I want to remind you this morning, even though we're here as a church, the church doesn't have a mission, really. I mean, what it is is that Jesus' mission has a church to be able to help him with. And because uh, those who comprise the actual church are joining Jesus on his mission, are supposed to be, uh, that's why we could easily say, and I think I often have, the church is one of the few organizations in the world that exists primarily for those that are not yet a part of it. Now, of course, someone who becomes a Christ follower, uh, we're responsible to teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded, which really defines the twofold responsibility of the church, evangelism and discipleship. Now, since Jesus' mission has a church, you know, it's completely appropriate to use the word missionary as an identifier of anyone who is a follower of Christ. Now, the only challenge today with this nomenclature would be our modern-day connotation of a missionary. Because if you ask the average person today, what is a missionary, what, what, what would we often envision? Well, most often, we think of someone who goes to another country or another continent like Africa and serves God there. But what we need to wrap our minds around today is the reality that where you live doesn't make you a missionary. It's not your address or your location. See, the definition of a missionary is a person undertaking a mission. And so what makes you a mission, a missionary, is the mission that you are on, regardless of your vocation or your location. And so this is what this all means, folks. It means that when you join Jesus on his mission, you become an everyday missionary. You're an everyday missionary. Now, I gotta tell you, five years ago, in response to this biblical doctrine, our leadership made a crucial decision that we needed to become a church family comprised of everyday missionaries. And some of that, honestly, has to deal with the fact that we found ourselves smack dab in the middle of a huge mission field right here in the Pikes Peak region. Because in the studies that have been done, uh, it's been found that at least eight out of 10, eight out of 10 of the people that you encounter every day are not connected with any kind of a Christian community and they're missing out on the benefits of a growing relationship with Christ and his people. So that was five years ago, 2018. We set a 10-year vision to 2028 to, to accomplish 100,000 everyday missionary moments with just the people that we live and work and play and learn with every single day. Now, an everyday missionary moment is nothing more than simply taking an advantage 
of an opportunity to get God on somebody else's radar. And that's exactly what Andy was doing in the video that you saw. Of course, God kind of tapped him on the shoulder a little bit. But because you, as you and I well know, there's a lot of people in this world out there who are doing life either oblivious to God or maybe intentionally ignoring him. And so we started in 2018. We were ramping up pretty well in, in, in the next couple of years, but I'm not sure if you remember something that happened in 2020. It's kind of like a worldwide pandemic that ex- disrupted our lives for a time. And so we kind of lost some traction. So I just got to tell you now, if we're going to make that goal, we're going to have to double our efforts. Back when we started, we were hoping that we would encourage everybody to have at least one missionary moment a month. (laughs) We're going to have to go up to like two or three now, so we're really up in uh, the ante. But what all of this means is that an everyday missionary is someone who lives each day as if it were a mission trip. Now, you know, we've, we've had several mission trips this year where we've gone overseas to Bangladesh and Nairobi and uh, Hungary, but you can go on a mission trip just out your front door. Because if eight of the 10 of the people that you encounter every day are not pursuing a relationship with God, then you and I should be on the lookout for some divine appointments every day. That's why in your sermon notes this morning, I included uh, a, a really an everyday missionary's credo. And uh, I would encourage you to make sure you have those notes. Put that somewhere so before you walk out the door in the morning, you can just kind of make note of that. In fact, what I'd like you to do is all of us, if we could read that together out loud. Are you ready today? Let's say it together. I am an everyday missionary. I'm excited to join Jesus on his mission today. I am alert and on the lookout for opportunities to connect people with the message of Christ and his love. Are you fired up? (laughs) Well, you know, I think most of us probably, if we're honest, we'd be saying here, you know, I'd love to be able to say that with gusto. (laughs) But I've got some real world experiences that tend to kind of temper my enthusiasm about that. And it's likely that I, I, most of us could probably come up with some legitimate reasons why we might, we might tend to avoid joining Jesus on his mission. One of those, obviously, is going to be fear. I mean, let's face it. Uh, when we go out there, we're going to be a little bit afraid of ridicule and rejection or maybe reactions that honestly could even maybe put us at risk. Because in today's world, there are people who are going to consider anyone who believes in God to be a little weird, a little strange, maybe simple-minded and fool-hearted. But just this last week, I don't know if God did it intentionally or not, but it was on a podcast that I was listening to. A preacher reminded me. He said, if you're afraid of offending people, you will invariably offend God. And if you fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom, you will invariably offend people. And i got to confess to you that more often than I'd like, I may be just a little bit more concerned about not offending other people than I have been about not offending God. Another reason why why we might avoid uh, joining Jesus is that it it can feel kind of awkward (laughs) and uncomfortable, doesn't it? That's probably why most of us raised our hands. And and I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I I think it's a lot easier to stand up here and talk about Jesus than it is to speak about Jesus to someone on the street. And that's because when you're here, everyone kind of expects me to talk about Jesus. But it's not what people expect in normal life. In fact, many people don't, be, don't want to be bothered at all. And they'll put up signs on their house, like the one that I found. <laughs> it says, welcome solicitors. This household charges $45 a minute to listen to sales pitches, religious messages, or any other speech you may be offering today. And these fees are payable in advance. There's people that are just like, hey, I, I don't want to hear it. And I think sometimes we would think to ourselves, well, what, what right do I have? What authority do I have to interrupt another person's life to tell them about Jesus? Remember whose authority you have? Jesus. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And I just got to share with you again of all the responsibilities I have as a pastor. This is actually the one that I feel the least proficient in. 
And it's an area where I literally, I struggle the most to lead by example. Another reason we, we may not jump in with Jesus on his mission is I think we just don't feel qualified. You know what? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I know enough. Don't feel qualified. Don't have a Bible degree. But you know, there's an example during the ministry of Jesus that provides some clarity on the qualifications needed to be an effective everyday missionary. Jesus had sailed across the Sea of Galilee, had gotten to the other side, and there encountered a man that was possessed by a lot of demons. He, of course, uh, freed him from the demon possession. And in Mark chapter 5, it says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, and you would have thought Jesus said, yeah, come on, (laughs) but Jesus did not let him. Instead, this guy who really had only known Jesus for a short, short period of time, was told, no, 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 I want you to go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And it says, well, so the man went away and began to tell the, in the Decapolis uh, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. The truth is, you, you really... All you need to know to become uh, an everyday missionary is what Jesus has done for you. And then finally, I just want to say the fourth reason, we can kind of get complacent concerning the mission. And that's easy the longer that you're a Christ follower. In fact, the people who are most effective at leading out of the people of Christ are new believers because they're so excited. And familiarity doesn't necessarily breed contempt, but it can lead to some complacency. I gotta tell you, when we moved up to the north side of Colorado Springs to minister here 17 years ago, I live over in a little neighborhood off of uh, Springcrest over here. I started thinking, I gotta get out and, and prayer walk my neighborhood and pray for those homes and for those people. And what's amazing, when I was faithful to do that, we had several people who from our neighborhood got involved here at, at ACC. But you know what? Now I've lived in that neighborhood 17 years. And I found myself becoming a little complacent and even indifferent. Now, I'm excited because I got to tell you, uh, that's going to change for me and I hope for some of you over the next 30 days. Now, it's easy to lose sight of the mission, honestly, just because life is so daily and we've got a lot of details and things on our plate. And that's when we somehow need to remind ourselves that not knowing Christ is an eternal life and death issue. If people don't have an opportunity to know Jesus, they're going to step into a Christless eternity, which is not going to be good. And so let's go ahead this morning, since we've just addressed those things, and kind of talk about the elephant in the room. Because being an everyday missionary will likely put you in some situations, let's be honest, that may cause a little bit of discomfort. But you know, Jesus is pretty clear that being a Christ follower is actually an invitation to discomfort. Now, you might not even know that because the world, since the world is so obsessed with comfort, people are often told, hey, all you need to do is just believe in Jesus, trust him, and you're going to go to heaven, which is totally true. But it's also true when you decide to follow Jesus that the rest of your life on this earth could also become more difficult and even more challenging. I mean, choosing to follow Jesus means intentionally putting yourself in a place of potential discomfort given this description by Jesus himself in Luke chapter nine, verse 23. And then he said to all of them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, when we hear take up the cross, what do we think of? We think crosses on necklaces, kind of beautiful things. We have a beautiful cross up here in front of the worship center that you can see. When Jesus said that to the people who heard him, what did they think of? they thought of a tool of execution. They'd maybe seen a family member or a friend or a fellow countryman hanging on a cross, and so Jesus says, take up a cross. Not to mention how we gotta, we gotta recognize we're often, and it's, it's becoming pretty clear, we're often gonna be at odds if we're following Christ with the world's philosophies. And we're starting to see that clash in our culture and that doesn't surprise Jesus at all, at all, because if you remember in John chapter 15, verse 18, uh, he said, hey, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it actually hated me first. Which leads us to the important part of what we need to, to, to look at, and it's a part of this process we're gonna go through in the next 
30 days. Joining Jesus on his mission and becoming an everyday missionary, that's why it's got to begin with prayer. And why should we start with prayer? I've got three good reasons. I'll go through them quickly. We, we need to start with prayer because, first of all, folks, that's how Jesus lived out his mission. If you study the life of Jesus, you'll find him, even though he's God's son, he knows more than anyone else, he always was getting a way to take some time to pray. And then when it was getting the most challenging and difficult for him on the night that he was going to be betrayed and then face uh, crucifixion in Luke 22, we're told he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. He prayed. And part of his prayer was just getting um, really in line with his father. He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me and that yet my, my will but yours be done. Second reason why we need to start with prayer is because that's how the church began the church was born in prayer uh, as the disciples actually followed Jesus' instructions. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, On one occasion he was eating with them and he gave them this command, Hey, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay there. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. And so after Jesus' ascension, after his left, they went back to Jerusalem and did what? Well, they waited. But you know, they also prayed. And we know that because 10 verses later in verse 14, it says they all joined constantly together in prayer. And then the third reason is that apart from God's empowerment, we're, we're powerless, folks. <laughs> if the church tries to do anything without a prayer covering, it requires the, the power of God. And uh, Jesus actually said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he told his disciples, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes unto you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you and I have to recognize whenever we try to do the work of God without the power of God, our human efforts at best are only going to be minimal and at worst maybe counterproductive. We, we got to be connected. Jesus said that in John 15, 5. He said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. I hope what I would have done this morning already is kind of lay a, a practice kind of a, a groundwork of, of, of the, the thinking behind this. But here's where I'd really like to get practical. And the reason I know we got to get practical today is because of the truth, or the reality that impression without expression leads to depression. And if you get, if you get impressed about something and there's not an outlet for that, it, it can be kind of discouraging and disappointing. And it doesn't do any good to talk about all this and not provide you with a way to actually do something about it. And uh, that's where this comes in. I don't know if you walked by. Some of you might even grab one. There's a book, another table out there with some books on it. This is called Pray and Go. And I'm excited because I, I've already been through the book, but I'm going to walk through the next 30 days or so and participate in all these things, and I'm hoping you do. It's a 30-day journey to help you become a better everyday missionary. Now, I want you to know that of the 30 days, 15 of them are going to be focused on praying about becoming more outwardly focused. So we're going to start with prayer. Five of those days are going to involve looking at key passages in the Bible about reaching out to others beyond yourself. And then the other 10 days, in those days, you're going to have the opportunity to prayer walk and to actually pray in front of 60 homes in your neighborhood or community, as well as send a note or an email to five people who aren't a part of our church, and you will have specifically invited eight people to visit our church. Now, I want you to know, it's short, it's simple, easy instructions to follow that make it very doable. And I don't know how many people are gonna get involved. Uh, I would just wanna say, if, if 100 people would, uh, that would equal, in totality of our time, 1,500 days of prayer, 500 days of studying what the Bible says about the Great Commission, 500 notes or emails to people, 800 invitations, and we will have gone into our community and prayed for 6,000 homes and families who live here. Now, obviously, there's the potential there for a lot of everyday missionary moments. Now, we ordered 200 books, which would double the numbers that I just gave you if that many people participate. And so if we run out, we'll order some more. But if you would be willing to take the step and not just, oh, I'll think about it. No, if you really, if you want to take the step, they'll be out here next week if you want. Pick up a book. And what I'd like you to do is just to commit to finish it. 
And I want to be honest, it might take more than 30 days. You know why? Because life gets busy and our day's full and we miss a day, and that's okay. The goal is simply to complete the 30 exercises and then leave the results up to God. And if you'll incorporate these 30 exercises, it'll be a huge step in joining Jesus on his mission and becoming better everyday missionaries. And I want to close you with you with you with just this, this final thought, because here's here's what we need to know. And I, I'd encourage you to have those 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 glasses that look on uh, as you leave today. All around us, every day, are people who need Jesus. And they just don't know it yet. And some people are resisting, some people are ignoring. Some are oblivious. They haven't got a clue. But do you know what the truth is? Some people are almost ready. And when we'll take a step, it's amazing what's happening. For example, here's what one surprised new Christ follower shared about what they experienced. Here's what they wrote. They said, I was born in South Korea and moved to Los Angeles when I was five. And I remember wondering, is there a God You see, my great-grandfather was one of the first church planters in South Korea, but the gospel didn't quite translate down the generations, and so I grew up in a non-Christian home. I didn't get saved until I was 16 years old, and it was when I was in Mexico. I encountered God to the point that every longing and thirst in me finally made sense. And so when I came home, I just started to talk about Jesus My father got saved, (laughs) my sister got saved, and my friends started to go to church. But I never once thought I was evangelizing. I I never once thought, oh, this is my strategy. This is how I'm going to get people to Christ. No, I I was just introduced to God, and he became my friend. (laughs) And from there on out, my life exploded with evangelism. Now, that may not be your exact experience. But what if God could use you to help another person? get to spend eternity in heaven. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being willing to send Jesus here on a mission, a mission that is vital to every one of us in this room because we all need a savior. We all need him. God, outside the walls of this church, In this community alone are thousands of people going on their own merry way, living life without a clue of you. God, you've called us to be salt and light, to make a difference in the world. I pray that you're going to stir in our hearts and call us to be the everyday missionaries that you want us to be. And so I commit what what happens out of this to you and pray that we'll see your kingdom come alive in people's hearts and lives and that eternities and eternal destinations can be changed because of your love and your grace. Guide us there, Father, in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.